наливаются кровью аорты и звучит по рядам шепотком. Я рожден в 94-м, я рожден в 92-м, и в кулак зажимая истертый год рождения с гурьбой и гуртом, я шепчу обескровленным в том. Я рожден в ночь с 2 на 3 января в 91-м ненадежном году, и столетия окружают меня огнем. On the 3rd of January 1891, the Russian poet Osip Mandelstam was born as son of a prosperous Jewish family. His father was a leather merchant, his mother a piano teacher. He spent his childhood in Petersburg, where he went to school, studied French and began to write. In Petersburg we shall meet again, as though we had interred the sun in it, and shall pronounce for the first time that blessed, senseless word. He wrote this in 1920. He had been a famous poet for some time, really from the moment his first volume of poetry called Stone was published in 1913. Photos from that period show as a dandy-like, self-assured young man. In 1916, the second, enlarged edition of Stone appeared. His second book of poetry, Tristia, came out in 1922. The title would prove prophetic. It refers to the fate of Ovid, the Roman poet, who was banned from Rome because the emperor no longer relished his presence. Mandelstam too was to experience the hostility of a ruler, but it had not yet come to that. The happy romantic poet spent a fair amount of time in cafes, but according to friends of those days, there was always an undercurrent of seriousness. This was just before the revolution. The Tsar never doubted that his reign would last forever, whereas the only real question was who would eventually succeed him. Hunger was not interesting. And demonstrations were met with acts and laws prohibiting public assemblies in the streets. It did not help the Tsar. The power of the people was not to be stopped, neither with paper nor violence. But even after the fall of the Tsar, violence continued at the same rate. In July 1917, the provisional government in Petrograd crushed a Bolshevik uprising. As a young man, Mandelstam had admired the Red Guard and had thought of joining the terrorists. But by this time, he had learned to despise violence and terror, irrespective of what political color went with it. Mandelstam spent the days of the revolution far away from the scene of the battle, in a small town on the Black Sea. In 1919, he was in Kiev, where he worked on a literary magazine. It was there that he had the most important meeting of his life, when he first saw his future wife, Nadezhda Yakolevna Khazina. She was to share his life to the end, difficult as it proved to be and she saved his work from destruction. In the 20s, Mandelstam was at the height of his fame. He published two volumes of poetry, prose, criticism, and in 1928 his collected poems. But at the same time, the party made life increasingly difficult for him. He became isolated. For Mandelstam refused to sing the praises of his own era the building of socialism, the voluntary weekend shifts of Soviet citizens, the hydroelectric dam in the Dnieper. Poetically speaking, he did not care. 
other poets and writers adapted to the new era. They were the quiet consenters or opportunists like Fadeyev on the right here. Later, under Stalin, he betrayed many a colleague. But the great Russian poets in those days, Gumilyov and Pasternak, valued Mandelstam highly. One of the greatest Russian women poets was Tvetaeva. For a short time, she was his mistress. And Akhmatova, his lifelong friend, was his twin sister in poetry. She too was persecuted, but unlike Mandelstam, she died a natural death. In the 30s, publishing was out of the question for Mandelstam. Russia was then a country in which the dream of the revolution seemed ever further from reality. Mandelstam was enraged by the cruelty and arbitrariness of Stalin's regime and by the destruction of the kulaks, the so-called large farmers. In fact, the measures against them meant death to countless ordinary peasants. Stalin set up farmers against each other, frightened as they were, and plunged the country into a famine. Mandelstam's anger found expression in a poem that finally led to his own destruction. Мы живем под собою, не чуя страны. Наши речи за десять шагов не слышны. А где хватит на пол разговорца, там припомнят кремлевского горца. Его толстые пальцы, как черви, жирны. А слова, как пудовые гири, верны. Таракани смеются усища и сияют его Голенища, а вокруг его сброд тонкошей их вождей. Он играет услугами полулюдей. Кто свистит, кто мяучит, кто хнычет, он один лишь бабачит и тычет, как подковы кует. За указом указ. Кому в пах, кому в лоб, кому в бровь, кому в глаз, что не казнь у него, то малина. И широкая грудь осетина. In 1934, Mandelstam was arrested on the strength of this poem, which he had only read to a few friends. In the notorious Lubyanka prison in Moscow, he was interrogated and, without any form of trial, sentenced to three years' exile in the north. It was there that Mandelstam tried to commit suicide. Then a miracle happened. Stalin allowed Mandelstam to choose the place of his exile. It was Voronezh. It was a difficult time, but also a very creative one. Anna Akhmatova, who visited Mandelstam, commented, And in the room of the exiled poet, fear and the muse stand watch in turn. In 1937, Mandelstam returned to Moscow, but he was not allowed to stay. He started a wandering existence, moving from one town to another, hunted and without means of survival. On the 1st of May, 1938, after he had been admitted to a sanatorium near Murom, a so-called act of charity on behalf of the Writers' Union, he was again arrested. And again, without any form of trial, he was condemned to five years' forced labor. No one ever heard from him again, apart from his brother Alexander, to whom he wrote a letter from the camp. Dear Sander, I am in Vladivostok, USTVL, Barracks 11. I got five years for counter-revolutionary activities. On the 9th of September, on transport from the Butyriki prison in Moscow, arrived here 12 October. Health very poor, totally exhausted, wasted, almost unrecognizable but I don't know if there is any point in sending clothes, food and money. Try all the same. I am very cold without clothes. On December the 27th, 1938, Mandelstam died in this Siberian transit camp. His widow, Nadezhda Yakolevna, survived him for many decades. For 20 years, she herself lived in constant fear of arrest, as the widow of Mandelstam, who had been sentenced as a counter-revolutionary and a Jewess into the bargain. For 20 years, she kept Mandelstam's poems, learned them by heart, 
and hid copies in secret places. At last, she managed to smuggle them abroad, where in the 60s the first edition of Mandelstam's work, as complete as possible, appeared in three fat volumes. Nadezhda then wrote two books of memoirs. Both were published abroad and translated into many languages. Her books are not only about Mandelstam and her memories of him, they deal with something much more general. How was it possible that so many Russian intellectuals, who before the revolution had grown up in circles where tolerance and speaking one's mind were of prime importance, could subject themselves to a regime so bloody, narrow-minded and fanatical that it killed people like Mandelstam and many, many others? After the 20th Party Congress, Mandelstam was posthumously rehabilitated. At last, his widow could return to Moscow. We visited her there in 1973. It was the 1st of May, when a million other foreigners were in Moscow to celebrate. We went unnoticed. With a Super 8 camera, we filmed her in her home during a short interview. It's the only film of her in existence, and we were only allowed to film her on the express condition that we would not broadcast it until after her death. She was still frightened of the KGB, the Russian secret police. The 1st of May, the day we spent with her, turned out to be a day in the life of Nadezhda Mandelstam with a very special meaning. First of all, I want to tell you that today is a date for me. The 1st of May, he was arrested for the second time, the 1st of May. Since then, it had been a long, lonely life without anybody, without any friends. I was among enemies, simply. And I had to live this life. It was very difficult. For six or seven years, I lived in this place. And here, I have found many friends, but not of my generations. Everybody is younger than me. Only young people are around. The old ones are still enemies. For example, the writer Kaverin, who wrote me a horrible letter about my book. He took offense about Tinyanov. He thought that I hadn't read it in Yanov, so as he did. It shows that we don't need any liberty of thinking or writing. Nobody can stand that another man or woman have another, have another opinion. The letter was horrible. One can't address such a letter to an old woman. But he did it. And another woman, Lydia Karnievna Chukovskaya, is writing a book against me. No. <laughs> I wish I could see it. It is, it will be very comical. He is righteous. She is always right. It is her first idea. Nobody can be right but her. What can I tell you about Mandelstam, if you know nothing about him? That he was a very fine man. That we laughed very much together. It was never dull with him, and we were very happy, even in the most horrible times. It was not because of me, but because of him. 
In the days we often quarreled, both had insupportable characters, but in the night we made love. It was a great success. It is comical to speak about sexual success at 73, no. but uh, it is, it is. <laughs> but it was the reason why we lived together. We couldn't live without each other. I tried to be unloyal to him, but it, I didn't succeed in doing it because everybody was worse than he. Поняли? Неприлично. Сумасшедшая старуха. Что вы? Это кафе. Это night club. And the first day we went together to bed. The very first day. It was also the first of me. Was that custom at the time to make love so quickly? We did it. We were the beginning of the sexual revolution. We had nothing to lose. I didn't want to marry anybody. I didn't want to marry Mandelstam. I tried to be independent. But you were married to him. It happened so. It simply happened so. What was it like to be married to him? I can't see. The nights were good. The days were difficult. He didn't let me go anywhere. He wanted me to be always present and with him. He didn't want me to make any friends. Was he egoistic, so? It wasn't egoism, it was something else. He was very strong-willed. And, and I was light-headed. <laughs> so it was a bit difficult. The writer, Andrei Donatovich Sinyavsky, was a friend of Mrs. Mandelstam. He is quite well known in Russia as a literary critic. He edited the most important Russian edition of Pasternak's poetry. Together with his friend Daniel, he was pallbearer at Pasternak's funeral. Together they published abroad, Sinyavsky under the pseudonym Abraham Terz. When this became known in the Soviet Union in 1966, both writers were imprisoned. It was the first trial in that country where writers were officially accused and tried on the grounds of what they had written. There were protests from all over the world, but both writers were sentenced, Sinyavsky, to seven years. Since his return from the camp, he has lived in Paris, where he teaches Russian literature at the Sorbonne University. Дмитрий Мандельштам как-то для меня, для всех нас, это какой-то удивительный носитель культуры, культуры как таковой. Mm -hmm. Не в виде суммы знаний или образований, там, книг, картин и прочее, а культуры в каком-то высшем смысле, культуры как структуры, как некой иерархии. Он дальше там вообще свойственна вот эта идея иерархии, может быть, больше всех других идей, иерархии композиции. И культура у Мандельштама и поэзии Мандельштама – это именно иерархия ценностей, слов, вещей. И поэтому сам мир, в смысле мироздания, – это культура. И вот этот человек такого масштаба и такого, э, такого понимания, я бы сказал, религиозного понимания культуры, попадает в ситуацию уничтожения культуры. 
и вообще уничтожение всего. И он становится босиком, люмпином, отщепенцем. He has written about it. He had written about it. In, in, po in po poems and, and so on. He thought that it would be a democratic state. Afterwards, he understood that it was quite the other way. But he hopes that it could be. In the beginning, he did. In the 30s, he understood that it couldn't be. Сумерки свободы. Прославим, братья, сумерки свободы. Великий сумеречный год. В кипящие ночные воды опущен грузный лес тенет. Восходишь ты в глухие годы, О солнце, судья, народ. Прославим роковое бремя, Которое в слезах народный вождь берет. Прославим власти сумрачное бремя, Ее невыносимый гнет. В ком сердце есть, тот должен слышать, Время, как твой корабль, к дну идет. Мы в легионы боевые связали ласточек, И вот не видно солнца, вся стихия щебечет, Движется, живет. Сквозь сети сумерки густые, Не видно солнца, и земля плывет. Ну что ж, попробуем огромный, неуклюжий, скрипучий поворот руля. Земля плывет. Мужайтесь, мужи, как плугом океан деля. Мы будем помнить и в литейской стуже, что десяти небес нам стоила земля. I think he was rather a revolutionary, but he was, was not satisfied with the revolution. He didn't understand he, that it was becoming a slavery for everybody. I understood it first. Why was it at first that Manushtam was not allowed to publish? It was very early, in 1923. It was the beginning of his silence. And why was that? First? Why? Because he was Drugova Testa. Is Drugova Testa. From a different mode. From a different mode. He was not a Soviet writer. And he didn't want to lie. He, so he simply couldn't lie. lie. 
he wanted to lie, but he didn't want to. Да? Да, Юраша. Здравствуйте, милый. The main feeling was a great pity for him because he was surrounded by enemies and the main enemies were the writers and the poets, the so-called poets. They always said, why can't he do as we are doing? But he couldn't. He was another kind of man. There could be no common language between them, because Mandelstam lived by ideas which had been erased from the minds of his contemporaries and denounced as outmoded obscurantism. Like the builders of the Tower of Babel, they had begun to speak in different tongues. Mandelstam had no hand in the building of the tower, and little wonder, therefore, that its builders found him incomprehensible. The builders of the tower, whether knowingly or not, played a part in all the crimes of the age. To carry out crimes on this scale, those responsible had to feel confident of unwavering and sympathetic support in the rear, some of the builders of the tower, though they were few and far between, and I knew none of them, had second thoughts, and many perished in 1937. It was among throngs of original builders of the tower that Mandelstam met his death, together with others who had never built anything and had known nothing but persecution. At the time, Mandelstam's death was seen as something perfectly natural, and it made not the slightest impression either in the world of art and literature or among the reading public. What right had an anachronism like him to exist in such times? For the right to live, one had to pay due tribute to ideology and the prevailing style. Alarmed only when those who did so were killed, people were quite indifferent about Mandelstam. Those who failed to pay their dues were not admitted to the superstructure. All they could hope for was a bunk in a labour camp. Though in our camps, as in the German ones, there were not even bunks, only bare boards. I would have gone to a labour camp rather than lived in a writer's villa, but for Mandelstam I would have preferred anything to those accursed barracks at the far end of the earth, with their suffocating stench, filth and typhus, lice, hunger and degradation, terror, armed guards, watchtowers and barbed wire. After this, to lie in a mass burial pit with a tag on your leg meant deliverance and peace. How is it possible to live when these thoughts are always with me? Вот после 82 книги Надежды Яковлевны московская интеллигенция разделилась. Одни были за нее, другие против нее. Она многих задела в этой книге. Причем за дело, так сказать, людей уважаемых, достойных, а не просто каких-то негодяев. И обиды были такие, ну как же вот, среди либеральной, условно говоря, интеллигенции, ну как же мы вот изо всех сил старались, там вот кому-то помогали, там кому-то даже деньги там переслали, кому-то там у себя на даче позволили жить из гонимых. А она о нас вот пишет так, как будто мы приспособленцы к власти, как будто мы шли всегда путем компромисса и так далее. Но действительно они шли путем компромисса. Здесь э, я сторонник Надежды Яковлевны в этом разделении, как можно догадаться. У нее другая точка отсчета, внутренняя, психологическая, и поэтому у нее такие резкие оценки. У нее, у нее мысленно, э, постоянно в ее книге, точка отсчета – это яма, общая могила какая-то, куда брошен Мандельштам с биркой на ноге. Голый Мандельштам. И вот она все время мерит вот этим критерием. Каверина или даже такого автора, как Тынянов. И поэтому она проявляет недовольство, как вот э, люди, не то что они подлости не совершали, но, ну, скажем, как-то устраивались все-таки. 
Вот, например, она мне рассказывала, по-моему, она, а может быть, кто-то рассказывал удивительное сочетание Пастернак и Мандельштам, ведь оба гонимы. Ну вот, э, Мандельштам после Воронежской ссылки одно время немножко жил в Москве, но уже надвигался, так сказать, арест и, и гибель. И получил даже э, комнату в Москве. И туда к нему пришел Пастернак, а Пастернак, он, он жил переводами, относительно благополучно жил, хотя тоже принадлежал, так сказать, к этой среде э, гонимых. Но он, так сказать, очень радостно, ну вот какая хорошая квартира, э, вот наконец-то вы устроены. А после, когда он ушел, Мандельштам написал вот свое страшное стихотворение «Квартира тиха, как бумага». Потому что это для него временный приют между ссылками, между арестами и, и накануне гибели. Вот так что даже по отношению к Пастернаку Мандельштам изгой и отщепенец. Отщепенец среди отщепенцев. Квартира тиха, как бумага, пустая, без всяких затей, и слышно, как булькает влага По трубам внутри батарей. Имущество в полном порядке, Лягушкой застыл телефон, Видавшие виды манатки На улицу просятся вон. А стены проклятые, тонкие, И некуда больше бежать, А я как дурак на гребенке Обязан кому-то играть. Наглей комсомольской ячейки И вузовской песни наглей, Присевших на школьной скамейке Учить щебетать палачей. Пайковые книги читаю, Пеньковые речи ловлю, И грозное баюшки баю Кулацкому паю пою. Какой-нибудь изобразитель, Чесатель колхозного льна, Чернила и крови, Смеситель, достоин такого рожна. Какой-нибудь честный предатель, Проваренный в чистках, как соль, Жены, детей, содержатель, Такую хлопает моль. И сколько мучительной злости Таит в себе каждый намек, Как будто вколачивал гвозди Некрасово здесь молоток. Давай же с тобой, как на плахе, За семьдесят лет начинать Тебе, старику и неряхи, Пора сапогами стучать И вместо ключа и покрены Давнишнего страха струя Ворвется в халтурные стены Московского злого жилья. Вы когда начали стетать его? Довольно Это... поздно. Потому что, понимаете, Мандельштам... К нему приходишь через каких-то поэтов. Да, Очень более. странно, что в лагере у меня, в общем, почти не было его стихов. Но в лагере я особенно ощущал Мандельштама. Именно, да. наверное, потому что вот тоже в ситуации культурно, да, конца да, культуры да, и да, последнего да, отщепенства да. он очень как-то помогал. Да, да. Понятно. А с Надеждой Яковлевной вы когда познакомились? Я сравнительно давно еще до лагеря с ней познакомился и как-то даже немножко подружились, ну так, не, не, не близкие а? друзья, но как-то, условно говоря, как-то сошлись. А до лагеря вы, вы знали, что она пишет эти книги? Или... Нет, по-моему, я не помню, по-моему, нет. Ты знал, но ты не читал. Да, что, я знал, что что-то она пишет, но... Ну что именно? Да, нет, не читал, да, да. И что она сохраняет все эти э, стихотворения? То, что она сохраняет в памяти, я знал. Да. Она просто рассказывала. Да, она, да, да. В разговорах она говорила о том, что когда посадили Мандельштам, она все учила наизусть и даже прозу учила наизусть. Да, да. Для того, чтобы, так сказать, сохранить... Поэтому с самого начала тоже она для меня была каким-то, вот тоже этим мостиком. Оттуда 
к нам. Вот человек, который в памяти держал эти стихи, потому что они могут погибнуть. И... Поэтому таким каким-то вестником, что ли, вот поэзии вот той погибшей к нашему да. поколению, она была для меня, для... Не, не только, наверное, для меня. I can say uh, the стихи о неизвестном солдате и осы. Как осы. Not the bees. <laughs> и без пчелы. Это осы. Дикая. Вооруженный зрением узких ос, сосущих ос земную, ос земную. Я помню все, с чем свидеться пришлось. И вспоминаю наизусть и в суе. Вооруженный зрением узких ос, сосущих ос земную, ос земную. Я чую все, с чем свидеться пришлось. И вспоминаю наизусть и в суе. И не рисую я, и не пою, и не вожу с мычком черноголосым. Я только в жизни впиваюсь и люблю завидовать могучим хитрым осам. О, если бы меня когда-нибудь могло заставить сон и смерть, минуя, стрекало воздуха и летнее тепло, услышать ось земную, ось земную. The power of written word. Yeah. I think nobody believes in it after Dostoevsky, because if they haven't heard Dostoevsky, whom would they listen to? is a sleeping country. Everybody is sleeping, you know. Если он это пустит, сейчас это будет ужасно. And you write a lot about Christianity in both of your books. But what did it mean for you or for Manuel Stamm to be a Jew? It didn't mean anything. Simply that we were Jews. Nothing else. And that we were Russian Jews. But in the fourth prose, Manushtan has written that it was impossible to be a Jew and write socially accepted literature in the same time. <laughs> Maybe. I know it by heart. Цыганское племя. Вороватые цыганщины писательского племени. He felt that he was a Jew. And I nearly didn't feel it. I am Christian from the birth. What is your dearest memory of Mamushtam? Everything is the dearest memory. He himself is the dearest memory. We didn't part because I believe in our meeting да я думаю что Советский Союз прекрасно мог бы существовать, советское общество и советская литература 
неубиваемым до штамма. Это было совершенно не, не нужно для, сохра... для сохранения этого режима. Тут другое дело. Дело ведь в том, что советское государство расправлялось, расправляется не просто с противниками или с врагами режима, а просто с другими, с непохожими людьми на этот режим. Потому что ведь, с моей точки зрения, суть вот этой государственной идеологии и, соответственно, уже это притворяется в жизнь, это похоже, ну, я бы сказал, на церковное понимание вещей. Но только церковь здесь без Бога. Но так же, как внутри церкви, церковь же не... Оно, церковь не, не развалится от того, что, скажем, существует Пушкин. И, в частности, церковь терпела вполне Пушкина. Но так как советская идеология охватывает все и не оставляет ни малейшего выхода, это все равно, что как бы церковь, скажем, включила Пушкина э, в число молитв. А, а в Советском Союзе можно только молиться и произносить заклинания. И поэтому человек э, другого склада, причем очень неус, неуступчивый, не идущий на какие-то сделки стилистические, вот остающийся самим собой, для нее все равно, что дьявол. И поэтому советское государство уничтожило Мандельштейн. Я не могу себя назвать, скажем, антикоммунистом, хотя я совсем не коммунист, не марксист. Ну, потому что я не могу даже себя назвать противником этого режима. Потому что я не, я не политический, не общественный деятель. И у меня, как и у многих других русских, коммунизму только, собственно, ну, две, что ли, просьбы. Не убивайте людей, первая, и вторая просьба, дайте свободу людям думать, говорить, писать, печатать то, что они хотят. Вот и все. А какой будет режим? Все равно. Вот. Но... Дальше, конечно, меня донимали вопросами и спрашивали, а все-таки, что я лично... Вот завтра во Франции ждать коммунизм, что я лично сделаю? Ну, я отшутился, но до некоторой степени это так и есть. Я сказал, что, ну, конечно, наверное, для храбрости бы сначала выпил. А потом бы стал придумывать себе другой псевдоним вместо Абрама Терца. Что еще остается?